Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is the Great Oxygenation Crisis, Earth's most catastrophic mass extinction event. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Eleanor Eady. Eleanor, thank you so much for being here today and for bringing us yet another fascinating topic. Let's dive in. Great. Thank you very much, Sunny. And hello to everybody. I hope that everyone has successfully navigated the transition to our new app as I did just a few minutes ago. So <laughs> happy to see so many of you here today. Uh, as Sunny said, my name is Eleanor and I am a Canadian-based expedition leader here with Natural Habitat Adventures. And while I get to spend a lot of my time, um, including recently in Churchill and other locations where we look at great, beautiful things like polar bears and the northern lights and beluga whales, today I want to take a step very, very, very far back in history and talk about what I find to be a really fascinating topic. <clears throat> One of many fascinating topics that that I, I like to look at through Earth's history, I like to think about big picture, and I'm really interested in the distribution of organisms through time as well as space, and looking at all the things that happened in the past to give us what we know today of our, our current planet and our current ecosystems. Because whether we're talking about mosses or lichens or lions or mastodons, every organism has its place within that much bigger picture of the history of life on the planet. So today um, we're going to talk about a major event that many of you are probably hearing about for the first time, or even if you've heard of it, you probably haven't thought of it in any degree of detail. And this is the Great Oxygenation event, uh, which was devastating to all life on Earth at the time. I'm so happy to see so many of you here today because you signed up for and are attending a webinar that's not going to have any pictures of cute animals or even of beautiful plants. Today, we are talking about rocks and algae and the destruction of life on Earth. So let's jump into it and uh, dive right in. So when I'm talking about the, the Great Oxygenation event, I'm talking about a time interval during early Earth when the atmosphere and ocean first experience a rise in the concentration of oxygen. So we're talking going back about two and a half billion years ago, and it ended around two billion years ago. It's known by a couple of different names, or by a few different names, actually. You've heard me refer to it as the Great Oxygenation Event, but it's also called the Great Oxidation Event, the Oxygen Catastrophe, the Oxygen Crisis, the Oxygen Revolution. And all of these names should give you some indication as to our perception of how this event must have affected life on Earth, which is that it would have been utterly catastrophic for all life that was present on Earth at this time period. <clears throat> now, we're talking about this as one of Earth's mass extinctions, but if you were to go online and kind of look up Earth's mass extinctions, um, this likely wouldn't be listed on whatever web page that you're on, and there's, there's no 100% agreement on any of the subjects around mass extinctions. It's generally agreed that there are five major ones that the Earth has gone through. People sometimes talk about that we might be in a sixth extinction, but um, evidence is still very much not set on that yet. When we're talking about a mass extinction, we generally define it as being constrained to the later period of Earth's history when we had multicellular life and life looked kind of like something that we would recognize. Um, and also, not only is it constrained to the later part of of Earth's history in our most recent time, but also is that um, is usually defined by at least a 50% worldwide loss of species over a relatively short time. So in terms of short time, we're talking several million years. It, it isn't short time on a human lifespan, but it's short term on a geological uh, scale. Um, so the, the mass extinction we usually talk about and we think about and we learn about in school is the big one, right? When the dinosaurs disappeared and a meteor hit the earth. But most of the, the other mass extinctions haven't had anything to do with external factors. It's all things that have happened on earth that have resulted in, in significant changes in the ecosystems and therefore significant changes in the life that 
is living on the planet. Um, so when we look at all of these mass extinctions, we don't really ever talk about the great oxygenation event uh, for, for those reasons, mostly because we define it as the more recent events. Uh, and also because, you know what, it's not just us, you know, when we're out on vacation and we want to look at polar bears, there's generally a pretty big focus on large animals and multicellular life. Um, and we don't necessarily talk about algae and other small things most of the time. On top of that, there's other challenges from talking about mass extinctions pretty far back because we're talking about life from before the fossil record started. It doesn't mean that we don't have other evidence, but we don't have fossils of this time. Um, so we're going to talk about a time called deep time. And it's a time that humans have a really hard time wrapping our head around. Um, this geological time scale here is one that I personally love looking at. I love infographics. I love anything that can, you know, give me a trilobite and a pterosaur and a pickup truck and an ammonite all in a single picture. Uh, so this is just kind of showing, starting at the top and working our way down, the different geological uh, periods within our planet's history. And our periods are marked by times of relative sameness, right? When we have similar organisms, often similar climactic conditions, when the, the world was in kind of a single location in terms of where the continents are located. And it also helps remind us that, you know, as we as we look down through the history of Earth, we often are looking down, right, where uh, we have something called a principle of superposition, where newer rocks are usually on top of older rocks, along with the corresponding fossils within these areas or within these time zones, pardon me. What infographics like this don't do well, because um, it's very difficult to show this, is show an accurate time scale, because all of this looks really cool, right? Dinosaurs and trilobites and reptiles and all these really cool things that we like to think about. But we're going to be talking about the very bottom line in this ladder, the, the Archean. And to talk about the Archean, it's not just a few steps down a ladder. It is all the way back almost to the very beginning of life on Earth. So this infographic here is showing us time on Earth broken down by its biggest divisions. They're called the eons. If you've ever used the expression like, oh, it's been an eon since I've seen you, there is actually like a definition of eon and it, these, these very long divisions of time within Earth's history that are marked by very, very different conditions. Um, it starts with the Hadean when the Earth was, you know, just starting to form and everything was still molten. Then we have the Archaean, so the very old time. We have Proterozoic, marked here by the dark blue here, which is early and visible, uh, sorry, early life. And then we get into the Phanerozoic eon, uh, eon, pardon me, which is visible life. And when we think of life on Earth, we're usually just thinking about the Phanerozoic, the time when life was big enough to see with the naked eye, when we had dinosaurs and trilobites and insects and all these other things. And I just want to take some time with this infographic because understanding how long we're talking about is really, really, really difficult. Everything humans have accomplished, everything we love and care about is just like less than a blink of an eye for the planet. And just to bring this into perspective about how long back we're talking, I'd like to take you on an imaginary walk. Um, so let's say we're, we're, we're starting in the morning and we're starting on a walk, but each step that we are taking takes us through a hundred years of history. So every time you take a step, boom, you step into the 1920s with your first step. The next step and you're in the 1820s and you're back in the industrial revolution with simply two steps. If you keep walking at, uh, at this pace, you know, at a relative walking speed, let's say you walk 20 miles per day, you would leave every part of human history and the entire human species behind by morning coffee on your first day. It would take you 20 days of walking at this pace to get to the point of the last time we had, you know, large dinosaurs on this planet. So back around 65 million years ago. It's not bad. Um, 20 days of walking, getting you back to dinosaurs. But to get us back to the time that we're ta ta talking about, the great oxygenation event, you would have to walk 20 miles a day, not just for 20 days back to the dinosaurs, but for two and a half years. So we are going so far back that it is very, very difficult for humans to really 
comprehend this time scale. Um, and we're going to go all the way back to about two and a half billion years ago, marking approximately the end of the Archaean at the start of the Proto-Rosaric, marked here on this infographic by kind of the hot pink going into the, the dark blue. So what are we looking at at this time in the Archean? What was the Earth like? Well, this here is an artist's interpretation of early Earth. You can see it looks blue. Um, according to the evidence that we have, which again is it's most of it's chemical in nature and most of it's looking at the rocks that existed at the from this time. Um, the current theory of planet formation is that the Earth formed relatively quickly and relatively quickly as well, we have the beginning of oceans. So if we look at the event time of the Archean, once we pass out of the Hadean, we start to get our first oceans. Um, and in fact, it's likely that the world had more water coverage then than today because we hadn't started building continents yet. It was just water sitting on top of oceanic rock. Um, when, we, when we look, okay, if anybody has taken a, a biology course or has taken a geography course, when we talk about these timelines, we tend to like write off the Archean as a time where not much happened. But in terms of the development of life on Earth, there was a lot that was going on, right? The development of the first oceans, the beginning of DNA, the start of the, the tectonic plates on Earth developing and starting to move in the formation of the first continent. It's also when we can identify the first definitive life on Earth. They may just have been prokaryote bacteria, but there was life on Earth for the very first time. And marking the end of it is what we're talking about that you know, the great oxygenation event. We know that there was a lot of water uh, from a lot of the rocks that formed during this time. For example, pillow basalt, which is a type of rock that we see now if you've ever gone, for example, snorkeling around Hawaii. It's what it looks like when, um, when basalt is formed underwater. So it kind of forms these big globs as it cools down in the water. And we have rocks dated at least 3.8 billion years old that show us that there was evidence of, of widespread oceans at this time. Um, and we also have isotope analysis that points towards I widespread oceans at this time as well. So Earth looked a little bit like what we understand, but what was significantly different wasn't just that we had very little life on Earth. I'll talk about what that life looked like in a second, but also that along with the ocean, we had the start of continents, those continents, Continents had no or very little life on it. And our atmosphere was significantly different than it is today. So when you think about today's atmosphere, you probably think a lot about oxygen because it's what we use. And you might think about nitrogen as well. Nitrogen is still the biggest component of our atmosphere. But if we step back before this great oxygenation event, it was looking like an oxygen of primarily nitrogen, just like today, but then carbon dioxide, water vapor, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane, and ammonia. So these are still the predominant gases that are released as volcanic gases today, so it makes sense that these would be uh, making up the early atmosphere of Earth. There was some free oxygen presence, but only at 0.001% of its current level. Now that's something worth noting about because we actually live in a very oxygen-rich like planet. By weight, oxygen makes up nearly half of the Earth's crust. So there is a lot of oxygen around. It makes up the rocks. Uh, it's found in water. It's found in carbon dioxide. But we are specifically talking here about free oxygen, the type of oxygen that is important to you and me and our, our dogs and everybody else who needs to be able to respire oxygen. Um, you'll note here in the infographic here that it's called a reducing atmosphere. And I'll come back to this chemical property as we go through. Basically, a reducing atmosphere, if you think back to your high school chemistry, a reducing atmosphere is one that tends to give up its electrons versus an oxidizing atmosphere would be one that tends to uh, take electrons away from things. So this might not sound very hospitable to you and me. We have a planet that's mostly ocean, uh, a a sun that isn't very warm yet, though all of this methane and carbon dioxide likely allowed it to be very warm, um, and no oxygen. But all of this doesn't mean no life. As we saw before, we do have the beginnings of both DNA as well as prokaryote life at this time. 
And really, it's again hard for us to wrap our head around because it's very, very different from how we normally think of life today. They are still membrane-bound organisms, right? They, they still kind of look like what we understand as cells, but they worked in a different way. Their chemistry and their metabolism worked in a different way. And as I mentioned, we don't really have a lot or much fossil evidence of this time. We have to go off of a lot of secondary type of evidence. So things like biomarkers, remnants of organic molecules that indicate organic processes that were happening at this time. For example, um, a, a type of isotope signature. So we have, we, if you think about carbon, for example, carbon comes in a couple of different forms. We have carbon-12, which is carbon that has six protons and six neutrons in its, uh, in its nucleus. But we can also have carbon-13, which has an extra neutron in its nucleus. These are biologically the same. They interact the same way with organisms. But because it's just a little bit easier for organisms to work with the lighter carbon, it is used preferentially in photosynthesis, in all biological life. So when we look at the proportions of carbon in inorganic rocks versus rocks that were laid down by organic processes, we see different chemical signatures in these two types of rocks because of this, it's called isotopic fractionation, where we get the, the fractions being different between the two processes here. So we start to see this, and this is very, very obvious in the, in the Archaean. We definitely have microorganisms that are present at this time. In terms of what life might look like without oxygen, well, it's life that we're still, you know, at least peripherally familiar with these days. Um, we can have things that live without oxygen, and we can have we can have organisms that that can they are autotrophic that can feed themselves without oxygen. It looks different than our plants of today, but there was um, definitely communities of bacteria and communities of photosynthetic bacteria at this point. So organisms have two different ways to get energy from their environment. They can either be a chemosynthetic organism, meaning that they are taking their energy from breaking down chemical compounds, or they can be a photosynthetic organism, meaning they can get their energy from sunlight. Now, an example of a chemosynthetic organism might be a bacteria that uh, uses methane as its form of uh, as its form of energy. In our photosynthetic organisms, we can have both photosynthesis that can happen in the presence of oxygen as well as without the presence of oxygen. So an example of a, of a chemosynthetic bacteria, there's a few different kinds. Um, primarily, they are organisms that work either on breaking down nitrogen compounds or organisms that work on breaking down sulfur compounds, like hydrogen sulfide gas, for example. Um, this is an example here of a nitrifying bacteria. This is one that lives in our current day soil. I don't have any pictures of anything that lived at this time. I want to point out with this that um, with, the, with the chemosynthetic roots that these bacteria took, it's not that they can do all of this without oxygen. It is that they can't do it with oxygen. So these chemical processes, it's not that they are independent of oxygen, it's that they only work in the absence of oxygen. One that you might be more familiar with is the, the organisms that grow around hydrothermal vents. So hydrothermal vents are often put forward as perhaps one of the lo locations where first life might have started. So these are vents where seawater comes into contact with magma on the ocean floor. So you get a lot of sulfur, uh, you get heat and you were in water and we have we still have organisms that that live in these environments again they are without oxygen in these very very deep environments and we have microfossils going back to the three and a half billion year ago time of uh of a variety of organisms living in these type of environments so these are an example of kind of sulfur digesting bacteria so they they take in let me make sure I'm getting this right. They take in hydrogen sulfide and they produce sulfur elements as waste products. So again, this can only be done in the absence of oxygen. Still life, it's just not life as we usually think of it. 
I think another way that we don't think of life often is photosynthesis in the absence of oxygen too. So if you have plants in your house or your garden, you, you're probably aware that plants today have two discrete processes that allow them to survive. They have photosynthesis that allows them to take in energy from, uh, from the sun and convert it into sugars and release oxygen, but they also undergo respiration. So they still do consume oxygen as part of their cellular respiration processes. There are organisms out there, not too many, but there are, uh, these days at least, that are able to photosynthesize but do not require oxygen for their respiratory processes. So this is called anoxogenic photosynthesis. It's found in some bacteria and some of the archaean bacteria, um, where again, the byproduct gel generated by this process is sulfur instead of oxygen. So probably if you and I walk back to this time when all of these organisms were, you know, spewing out nitrogen products and spewing out sulfur into the atmosphere, we wouldn't think of it as a very great place to be. But this was the dominant way that that organisms made a living in the Archean times. Now, it doesn't mean that there weren't other organisms starting to do what we think of as a normal photosynthesis today. Uh, we do have evidence that there was also oxygenic photosynthesis, so oxygen. Um, uh, oxygen producing photosynthesis. Uh, this, this fossil that you can see in this image here is a sedimentary structure called a stromatolite that is established as these, photo, these like photosynthetic microbes build up on top of sediments. And as they continue to grow, they aggregate these layers on top. Um, and we have stromatolites again, looking back into the Archean time. Um, we might find it hard to look at this and difficult to interpret as conclusive signs of life, but we are very, very confident about these being proof of life for a number of different reasons. Um, like I said, these types of fossils like we're seeing here, as well as some of the isotope and rock signatures that we can see. We also have evidence in that stromatolites continue to exist today. Uh, you can find them in Western Australia. Um, there are a number of other locations on Earth where they're found as well and that those conditions are thought to mimic those of ancient seas. And what I wanna bring us to is that we have evidence that microbial life was global by about three billion years ago. So by the time that we're looking well before that great oxygen crisis, we have established communities, we have established species, we have established forms of um, photosynthesis that didn't require any kind of oxygen, we have chemosynthesis, we have we have an ecosystem, we have a global ecosystem. Sure, it's it's dominated by prokaryotes, um, right? I call them my happy little algal mats, but the earth is full, right? We have algae and mats along the coast, we have algae growing in the upper ocean zones, we have algae on land. Um, it might not sound diverse like our planet does now, but these represented many, many different species, many different genera, different families. They covered nearly the entirety of the earth and they lived in ecological communities. Just because they didn't have eyes or legs doesn't mean that it wasn't a functioning ecosystem. It just wasn't what we think of today as a functioning ecosystem in that all of the organisms were prokaryotic, meaning they didn't have a nucleus. They were all microbes, meaning that they were all very small and not visible to naked eye. And they were living in a world without oxygen. Now, as a little aside, kind of, but I think it's a really interesting aside, there's a lot of evidence that points that what early Earth would have looked like wouldn't have been something like what I'm showing now, but something more like this. And this is something I call the purple Earth hypothesis. It's a really interesting theory. And yes, it is a theory. And it's mostly being talked about today as we um, search for new planets to support life in our in our galaxy and this is the the theory that green when we're looking at planets that might support life green is not the only color we should be looking for and in fact green is almost an accident that happened within within our planet the earliest types of photosynthesis that were taking place on early earth didn't use chlorophyll right they weren't taking place with our our oxygen based photosynthesis they used a different kind of molecule to absorb light and they were really good at absorbing green light, leaving behind 
purple light, meaning that um, you would see an environment that looked predominantly purple when you looked at the planet as a whole instead of blue and green as we see today. So with this type of alternate pigment that evolved well before chlorophyll did, um, they it's best at absorbing that very energy rich green and yellow colors of the visible spectrum, but it leaves behind the red and blue light, meaning that what we are left with to see is that kind of purpley color. Chlorophyll evolved after this, this, this type of pigment is called retinol. So chlorophyll actually evolved after retinol as a almost like an afterthought because it had to take what was left over. Chlorophyll absorbs red and blue light, leaving green light behind because green light had already been absorbed by the predominant life forms on the planet. So the fact, and I'll talk about why we don't have, we'll get to why we don't have purple organisms anymore, um, but we likely were looking at an early planet where the predominant color of productivity uh, was purple and that our green just happens to be an accident of what was left over after these purple organisms couldn't survive anymore. So it's, it's very possible, and in fact, some scientists think it's likely that early Earth's biosphere was dominated by these purple retinal-powered colonies that absorbed all those uh, shades of green light. And I just think that's, that's just so interesting. Okay, so this is our planet's pre-great oxygen event. What changed? What is this massive change that has come in and destroyed early Earth as we are looking at it today, which, okay, yeah, it's early. There aren't any land plants, but it looks like a pretty neat place. It's got a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, plus it's purple and that's pretty cool. Well, we are seeing the continued growth and proliferation of a new form of, uh, of organism, specifically something called cyanobacteria. You might know cyanobacteria by its sometimes better known name as blue-green algae. Uh, what you might know about blue-green algae might come from, you know, living close to a waterway where you get algal blooms that can be toxic to a lot of, a lot of animals, for example. So blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, to use their more correct term, they're still prokaryotes. So they are still single-celled organisms without any internal organelles. But unlike our purple buddies that we just saw, they access energy from the sun by harv harvesting it from chlorophyll. So they're taking those colors that were left over after retinol took out all those, um, all the green. And the most important thing about chlorophyll is that by using the way chlorophyll works as a pigment, it harvests um, energy from the sun and releases oxygen as a byproduct. So here's our first time in our planet's history where we are starting to see the mass production of free oxygen. So it's not oxygen that's bound up in water or bound up in silicon dioxide or anything like that. It is being released as O2. Now, this is a very slow process, okay? Again, when we talk about geological timescales, very difficult to understand for humans, this process probably took around 400 million years for our, our green friends here now to start adding oxygen to the system to the point where it started interfering with the rest of life on Earth. In terms of perspective, 400 million years is almost the entirety of the time that multicellular life has existed, right? So that we've had animals and plants and things living on, on our planet. So we're talking a very long time scale. Why is oxygen bad? Well, oxygen is highly reactive. And as it begins to accumulate in the oceans, um, it's going to start interacting with minerals that are present there until it can't do that anymore and has to go into the atmosphere. How do we know that we have a, an environment that was dominated by, you know, an anoxic atmosphere and then a very oxygen-rich atmosphere? Well, the primary change that we see is a big change in the rocks that were formed before and after this great oxygenation event. One of the types of rocks that we see, they're often called red beds. Um, they are some form of sandstone that are predominantly red in color due to the presence of a type of mineral called a ferric oxide. So ferric oxide 
might uh, you might hear the ox and oxide for oxygen. These are rocks that contain um, iron that has interacted with oxygen. Now we don't get these red forms, these ferric oxides happening in an environment that doesn't have oxygen in the atmosphere. Before the great oxygenation event, all of the minerals that were produced were minerals that could exist and could be formed um, in a low or no oxygen environment. And in fact, they couldn't form in an environment uh, with oxygen. And then we see a massive shift towards uh, these rocks and, and minerals that can only form in the presence of oxygen. This, uh, this image here is something called a banded iron formation. They're one of the best types of evidence that we have for this event. So this rock would have been laid down during the process of that 400 million years. Like the great oxygenation event is a, is a long period of time that we're talking about, but a lot, there was a big change from the beginning to the end. So I actually took this photo um, at the Australian Museum in Sydney last year, um, and I am a giant nerd, as you might understand, and had a really hard time walking away from it. Um, this rock tells us a tale of that destruction of life on Earth, and a tale of these new organisms modifying the planet to such a degree that we can still see it in rocks two and a half billion years ago later. They changed the planet in a way that affected all life on Earth, and the evolutionary paths of every single being to live on Earth after them. So when we look at this rock, we have alternating bands of three types of minerals. There's tiger eye, um, which is a silica mineral. There's the bands of jasper, which are red. Uh, They're also a silica mineral. And then dark bands of iron oxide, which are hematite and magnetite. These will represent ancient layers of sediments on the seafloor during this time of the great oxygenation event. So as oxygen was starting to be produced by these, these cyanobacteria in the oceans, um, the first thing that would have happened is that they would have first filled up the oceans with oxygen. Now, as those, those oceans became oxidized and as they became full of oxygen, all of that oxygen would have interacted with the huge amount of dissolved iron and dissolved silicon within the water. So instead of being free and uh, free floating within the water, every piece of iron essentially got bound up by oxygen and laid down as these iron beds um, to form iron oxide. So these sediments accumulated in alternating bands on the ocean floor. Basically, all of the oxygen was produced, it attached the iron, and it precipitated. Oxygen was produced, it attached the silicon and precipitated. And we just kept having these, these fits and starts of extra oxygen being added, all bound up by, by the minerals. And it wasn't until all of the iron and all of the silicon had been removed from the ocean that we could start filling up the atmosphere with the ocean, uh, sorry, with the oxygen as well. Now, 90% of all of the, the weight of all of our known iron deposits on Earth are from this period of time. So without this addition of oxygen to the atmosphere and to the oceans, we would not have iron deposits for our you know, industry and things like that today. So once the ocean was at capacity with its oxygen, the atmosphere was next, and oxygen slowly became a much larger component of the atmosphere. Today, we have an, ox uh, an oxygen component is around 21%. We think it reached levels of um, quite up to about 80% during the time of the great oxygenation event, but it was, it was incredibly sporadic. So there's evidence kind of in both directions. We know that there was a rise, that rise likely stabilized around 10%, but it seemed to jump all over. Now, this image here, um, obviously we don't have trees or horses at this time yet. I'm just showing you kind of what the new constituents of the atmosphere are like at this point. Now, other things followed with this too. When we start having free oxygen in the atmosphere and it starts filling up the atmosphere as well, it's gonna start to interact with solar radiation. And that O2 is gonna become O3 to form what is we now have as an ozone layer. The development of the ozone layer took quite a long time. 
Um, so for a long time, we had a develop uh, an, an environment with lots of free oxygen and lots of radiation. Uh, our UVA radiation is a, the stuff that still gets to us today, even through the ozone layer. UV, UVB is quite a bit reduced by our ozone layer, and UVC is eliminated by the ozone layer. Um, UVC lights is extremely damaging to DNA, so it's one that we're very happy to have removed from our, our atmosphere, but it wasn't yet removed at this point. So we have now, okay, we've had these cyanobacteria come in, they've changed the oceans to be full of oxygen, they've now changed the atmosphere to be full of oxygen. We now have an environment full of oxygen, um, which is incredibly toxic. Believe it or not, oxygen is an incredibly toxic <laughs> um, element and is something that all of a sudden, all of these organisms had to contend with. And not only that, we also had incredibly high levels of radiation because the ozone layer hadn't, hadn't developed yet. So if you recall, I said at the beginning that we're talking here about prokaryotes. So our organisms like bacteria and archaea that don't have any membrane bound organelles. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have a mitochondria. Um, they just have kind of their, their cell wall or their capsule and, uh, and that's kind of it. Everything else is contained within that single wall. We are now looking at a time where we have extreme pressure on all of these organisms because of those high levels of radiation, because of those high levels of oxygen. And we think that this is probably the single biggest reason that we now have eukaryotic organisms today. So this is a theory called the, the theory of symbiogenesis. So it was a number of mergers that happened between the different, uh, the different bacteria at that time to give us um, what we now have, like either mitochondria within our cells or chloroplasts within cells to give us our plants. So the theory being that we don't have a number of evolutionary pathways that led us to these higher life forms it was probably, in fact, one bacteria that kind of went gloop to another one, and it then contained the first bacteria and took on the advantages of everything that brought with it, thereby also bringing more protection to, um, to what was contained within that second cell. So this, uh, this endosymbiosis was likely the only way that a number of these organisms could deal with all of the free radicals and all of the oxygen in the atmosphere, as well as the incredible amount of DNA damage that was happening as a result of the oxygen and the radiation that was coming in at this time. Must have been just a, uh, just a terrible time to be around, honestly. So let's just, let's just go back to the oxygen for a moment. I'm talking about how it's how terrible it is, and this seems very difficult for us to, to understand, because all life as we know it today depends on oxygen as a critical part of our metabolic pathways. And that's because we've had to evolve to accept it. It wasn't, it's not that it, oxygen is inherently what life needs, it's that we had cyanobacteria that came along and produced a lot of oxygen. Therefore, the only organisms that could go on to survive and evolve were the ones that that had an affinity for oxygen and can integrate it into their metabolic pathways. So oxygen has a great affinity for electrons. It's an oxidizer, meaning it takes electrons away from other molecules. And we have a lot of parts in, like whether it's us or whether it's plants, there's a lot of pathways within our, our metabolic systems that require the presence of oxygen to accept and pass on electrons, like our electron transport chain, um, like this thing that you can go on to fully ignore because I hope to never have to memorize these things again. <laughs> so this is the citric acid cycle. But we've, we've had to work oxygen into our system because we live in a world with oxygen. Without these evolutionary adaptations, oxygen is toxic to those organisms that, that evolved without the presence of oxygen in their atmosphere. Uh, and in fact, it's still kind of toxic to us anyway. Um, so here, you know, we think of oxygen as good, 
Oxygen is, is um, it's a challenge for us and it's one that we've had to work around. So one of the things oxygen does really well, like I said, is accept electrons. And we have what are called reactive oxygen species. These are um, often groups of oxygen with hydrogen or other molecules in there that really want to accept electrons from everything around them. Uh, and these cause what's called oxidative damage. So if we, if we interact with reactive oxygen species, you know, whether it's because of radiation, whether it's from our atmosphere, whether it's because of pollution, um, they can cause damage through oxidation to our DNA, to our proteins, to our cell membranes. And our bodies do their best, but this damage as a result of living in an atmosphere with, with oxygen cause inflammation, they cause injuries to our cardiovascular system, and they also cause our overall aging process. And if you ever hear of somebody saying that they're rusting to death, that's not entirely wrong because that's essentially what's happening to our very DNA and to our, our cell walls themselves, is that we're reacting with oxygen and eventually we have so many reactions that our body can't, can't account for it anymore. Now we've worked this into our, how our bodies work. Um, we actually use like reactive oxygen species within our immune system as a way to kill off invading bacteria and viruses, um, but they still are harmful to us as well. And if you've ever heard about how we need to eat a lot of antioxidants, this is because um, we are looking to reduce the damage to our DNA and damage to our cell walls and proteins. Um, by eating antioxidants, we are eating things that are willing to give up their electrons to these radical, uh, to these reactive oxygen species so that they're not stealing electrons from our body. And it seems like such a small thing to, to worry about these electrons, but it does cause damage again to our DNA, to our cells and other parts of our, our bodies as well. Um, so we can thank out antioxidants and uh, as another little aside, um, the most consumed antioxidant by humans is coffee and tea, even though recommendations are that we should be eating more fruits and vegetables. Coffee and tea are antioxidants as well. But for those, for those first organisms, our, our purple friends who started life on Earth, um, who led us to have the green plants that we have today, oxygen was poisonous. Oxygen was bad for them. And when we think, sometimes we, we look at this planet and we think, wow, why is Earth so perfect? How did it develop so perfectly? It's not that it's perfect for life. In fact, there's a huge section of life that couldn't tolerate these conditions and that died off or that can now only be found in hydrothermal vents or in our own gut flora um, where no oxygen is found. It's that the life that survived and evolved grew to grew around these conditions. So not only was oxygen directly toxic to these early organisms, it also reacted with the very food that those organisms required. So our sulfur count compounds, our methane, those compounds that, that fueled early life on Earth reacted with with oxygen and were removed from the atmosphere and from uh from the oceans so when we say that you know there was a mass extinction but we don't have fossils there there had to have been a mass extinction there's no other way that this could have functioned we we went from one way of life to a completely different way of life and if you think about it being you know a, a book or a movie of a disaster show of some kind we have this new life coming in. Like just imagine if there was one day you wake up and there's all this news about this new type of bacteria and it's using a new metabolic pathway that we've never seen before. And it ends up being able to, let's say it can eat carbon dioxide, but as a result, it eats that carbon dioxide and we think, great, great, great. But its waste products are methane, for example. So we would, if that, if that new life continues to survive and thrive, it would, you know, change our planet, it would change the atmosphere, it would take your food, it would take the very air that you breathe, and it would make life completely, you know, it would make that earth uninhabitable for the life that exists currently. It's analogous to what happened back then. We had this new type of, uh, new type of organism that came in, and it changed everything. It changed absolutely everything. It changed the rocks. It changed the oceans. It changed the the uh, 
you know, the atmosphere itself. And not only, not only that, so, okay, so we have all of that early life or almost all that early life being killed off. Here's something that happens next. If you're looking at this infographic, it gets even worse because now all of this free oxygen is interacting with the methane that was in this early atmosphere. So up until now, we haven't really done much with the methane, but as oxygen increases in the atmosphere, methane decreases. This is very, very early in our planet's life. And this is at a time when um, our sun isn't nearly as hot as it is now. So as methane decreased and we lost those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we saw a start of global cooling and the start of what's known as the Huronian glaciation. Um, so this was a period of numerous glaciations. We have glacial deposits at low latitudes um, where it's known sometimes as snowball earth. And, you know, life was great until it wasn't. And there was not only was there extinctions of the first life on Earth, they did so well that they kind of shot themselves in the foot and they caused this global glaciation and killed off nearly all of those new species as well. So it's kind of, um, kind of, not kind of, it is incredible that anything survived, honestly. So that, that algae did what algae does. It bloomed, it took advantage of everything, it changed the, the system and used up all the resources, and then it collapsed. Um, so again, we're not talking instantaneous, we're not talking a single summer, this is over several hundred million years, but this represents one of the worst, if not the worst biological tragedy in our planet's history. So the end of almost everything that came before it, and the end of pretty well everything that came after it as well as a result of being too efficient and changing the world uh, in a way that didn't work for them either. We went through, let me just go back for a second, this period of time where oxygen shot up and then it came down because almost all of these, these oxygenating species died off. So we had, we went up and then down. And from there on, it took nearly a billion years to kind of recover to where we were at before this time and to a point where we could start to have uh, further life starting to develop. So we, we know that there was a tremendous loss of biodiversity and bio, and bioproductivity at this point. So this takes us through the end of the Archaean and the end of the great oxygenation event um, or the oxygen crisis and into a period of time called the Phanerozoic, which is early life. So this is when uh, we're starting to see all of those those after effects from the oxygen crisis and the oxygenation event. So our eukaryotic life, our snowball earth, but also then the beginning of multicellular life. All of what this all did in the end was open up lots of space. So all of these niches that had been filled by these, these early bacteria um, and cyanobacteria now had space for multicellular life and eukaryotes to move in. Oxygen does, you know, continue to rise through this time as the world slowly refilled with photosynthetic organisms and our oceans and atmospheres become more like they are today. So all the way through this time, like life becomes as we know it now. We might have kind of pulses in life. We might have, you know, trilobites versus dinosaurs. But the base of life, the chemical processes that we recognize as normal today to sustain life established at this point in time. And it wasn't until the end of this, this oxygen crisis and the destruction of pretty well all that early life on Earth that brought us to this time that we now kind of led ultimately to us and to whatever else comes after us. So I think it's always really interesting taking a look at these, these kind of crisis events and seeing what resulted from them. And from here, we can see the rise of of chlorophyll-based photosynthesis and the decision to use green as a pigment. So we recognize green as being the, you know, the, the only way plants can be today, but it's just one way and it was a secondary choice. And the rise of that multicellular life as well all came out of this time. So I hope that that's brought us some, you know, interesting perspectives and uh, some maybe something that you didn't know much about beforehand. So with that, if there's any questions on this tremendously odd subject, I will hand back to Sunny to 
to help with those. Eleanor, thank you so much. You are so good at explaining these difficult concepts and making them really, you know, easy to understand and fascinating. So we've got some great questions for you. Um, but I want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, earlier in your presentation, both hominids and Hadean sh are shown in hot pink, the circular chart. Are those periods synonymous? Let's go back and take a look. And I know it's a, oh, there we go. It's a big chart. So the hominids and Hadean are not synonymous. You can see that our, our hominids, so humans and human ancestors, um, are kind of up in this kind of more of a, well, to my eyes, they're reddish. So human history is just this little blip kind of at the beginning here. And then the whole of the hominid history kind of stretches across. But this black line here represents you know, the start of things, and then we go around clockwise. So we start at 12 o'clock here on this chart. We go through the Hadean, so starting around 4.6 billion years ago when, when we think the Earth started to form, to around 3.8 billion years ago into our, our kind of purpley pinky here in the Archaean, which is kind of that period of time and we're mostly talking about, and then that transitional time around 2.5 billion years ago from the Archaean to the Proterozoic, and uh, this being the time of our great oxygenation event there. Hmm. Okay. Um, did you say that organisms are present in intestinal microbiomes that are like the Archean non-oxygen requiring organisms? Are they methane I producing? <laughs> <laughs> are they methane producing like in cattle? <laughs> um, yes. So we can we can laugh about this a little bit, right? And say, that, oh, you know, uh, our, all of our cows and our um, and perhaps our own gut biome are just supporting all of those organisms that were left without an environment uh, after the great oxygenation events. And so a lot of that, like when we produce methane or when cows produce methane, um, it's not you know directly our biology that's causing methane to be formed. Um, we're not so good at digesting things. It's the bacteria within our gut that are good at digesting things and breaking them down for us to absorb. And one thing that, you know, it might, it's probably, it's likely not the exact bacteria that were present at this early time in our, you know, our, where are we here? Our, our purple friends and things like that. Um, but it was something analogous to or a relative thereof that was able to colonize the insides of other things. So they, they were able to sustain themselves in areas of low oxygen, so around the hydrothermal vents, uh, in high salt areas, or in other kind of extreme environments that were not anywhere that other organisms could live. And by colonizing those extreme environments, they're able to then be present in our own gut flora as well. So it's something that's, you know, we could, I think it would be quite fascinating to look at the genetics of our gut flora and see how far back they can be tracked. Um, but they are similar to, if not, you know, not identical to, but similar to some of those first organisms that lived in that low to no oxygen environment. Hmm. Fascinating. <laughs> are, are we able to apply this um, process to other planets in our solar system. Oh yeah. So that is like, in terms of applying the process, I'm going to take that question as, can we use this to find other planets that are suitable for life? And the answer to that is yes. So when NASA is looking for evidence of life elsewhere in, in the solar system or elsewhere in the galaxy, we're not just looking for the presence of green or blue, we're also looking for some of these other types of pigments that might indicate life is found as well. In terms of can we use this process to like terraform another planet, for example, that would be a very, very interesting strategy because it really was something that um, I don't know the answer to that. You would still need similar conditions to what we had on early Earth. So our early bacteria were able to survive and thrive because they they had a no oxygen environment, but also because they had 
you know, liquid water. We had a lot of heat. We had an, when we had an atmosphere. So it's not just nothing and they were able to grow. They still required those those elements. They still required an atmosphere. So perhaps there might be an opportunity for like another distant planet sometime in the future for terraforming. But I can't think of anywhere in our solar system that has those exact same early Earth conditions that we could bring in purple bacteria to start photosynthesis in. Hmm. OK. Um, the next question is, so cy cyanobacteria arose from what? Ah, cyanobacteria arose from what is the question? Cyanobacteria were, well, this is a very good question in short. So we do have, um, I was trying to see if I had a, an infographic hiding, but I don't. There is a last universal ancestor of all bacterial life on the planet. And to look at that last universal ancestor, we have to go way far back to around 3.8 billion years ago when we look at the molecular clock of those organisms. But um, so when we're looking at that, we're looking at the um, like the rates of mutation, the rates of speciation, and we're taking the the um, bacterial organisms that exist on the planet right now and kind of tracking them back to see if there was a time when they were likely all related to a single organism. And the evidence right now suggests that they were so that Earth may uh, so that life on Earth may have only started once and everything kind of came off of those early organisms. This is very speculative, obviously, because we're using non direct methods of analysis. We can't go back in time and look and see what was there before cyanobacteria, um, but they are related to other types of bacteria. They, they're not the same. They have a whole new pigment that they used. Um, there was probably some kind of intermediate form that doesn't exist anymore because it wasn't as good as cyanobacteria, but cyanobacteria are very, very good. And once they established, they really dominated the, the oceans and they still today account for about 20% of the oxygen that we breathe just as a single group of organisms. And these are, we're talking very small celled organisms at that. So they are, they are extremely well adapted to what they do and they've been around a very, very long time. Um, whatever came before them j probably just wasn't as good as what cyanobacteria can do. Mm. Well, I just wanna echo the comments that you are such a wonderful teacher and um, very, very interesting topic. So thank you again, lots of applause. I don't know if you can see that in our new system, but oh, lots of applause. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the last question we have time for. So I'm gonna turn it back to you for closing comments. Okay. Uh, well, as a closing comment, I'd really just like to thank everybody for showing up. I think it's it's something hard to to sit through sometimes because it's not again it's it's rocks and algae it's not it's not pretty polar bears that we're talking about here but it's just such a a fascinating topic and to look at what could have been as opposed to what is now is always going to be of interest to me so i'm glad to see it's of interest to others as well thanks so much for coming by today and maybe we'll talk about another mass extinction some other time I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. And once again, thank you for submitting such fabulous questions. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.